good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate the safety uh, metrics for AVA's panel discussion. And AVA safety is obviously an important topic, and safety is probably the most important factor for consumer acceptance with AVA's. But AVA safety is also a complex topic, and there are many aspects need to be considered. The expectation is that uh, commercial um, deployed AV will have better safety performance than human drivers. But uh, how can we assure that? Um, before we can assure, more importantly, how do we measure AV safety? Um, that's where our safety metrics coming in. Um, in general, In general, safety metrics uh, can be used in two types of situations. One in real time, um, safety metric can be used to assess and quantify the risk of driving situation and can be used to assist AV decision making. The other is in a post-trip or historical mode. In such case, the safety metric can be aggregated to evaluate AV safety performance. This can be aggregated over a limited or a large number of trips. Safety metric can be also uh, categorized into leading and lagging metric, metrics. Leading metrics often relate to vehicle kinematics and driving situations in real time, while lagging metrics often related, uh, relates to safety outcomes in terms of frequency uh, and severity of crashes. Here in this panel discussion, we are mostly focusing on the discussion of the leading matrices, uh, leading metrics. Um, the computation of leading metrics um, also depend upon assumptions on road behavior and model parameters, and as well as uh, threshold values. Different behavior assumptions will lead to uh, different metrics. We know that some metrics assume um, all vehicles maintain their current state, for example, time to collision, um, and others may assume the worst case scenarios. And because of the different assumptions, obviously these safety metrics uh, should be used differently. So on, on the slides, I show you one particular example. It's a very simple example. The blue vehicles is the subject vehicle, it's the AB. And, um, the green vehicles is what we call principal other vehicle which interact with AV. And that vehicle is making a cut, cut in a maneuver so that uh, the AV need to calculate the safety situation or the safety metric uh, in this situation. The green vehicle represent the other background vehicles. As you can see from such a simple scenario, if you give different behavior assumptions for these background vehicle, for example, the POV, all the green vehicle, which is the uh, BV, and that will lead to different safety metrics. And also, if we assume different behavior for AV itself, this will also lead to different, um, different safety metrics as well. Um, so, so, so that's why these model parameters and these threshold values um, to determine when it's safe, when it's not safe, um, it's also make a, a huge difference. So for example, what parameters we should uh, assume for the surrounding vehicles in terms of their um, acceleration or deceleration rate? Uh, what would be the threshold to define safety? So all of these questions are open questions and deserve a lot of research. And we will discuss some of these in this panel discussion. Today, we have assembled a, an outstanding panel around this topic. David LaBlanc, uh, Do, uh, Dr. David LaBlanc from Armtree, Dr. Jeff Wishart from uh, Exponent, Dr. Bowen Wang from Transportation Research Center, and uh, Dr. Arno Hitchberg from Graz University of Technology. And each of the panelists have extensive experience on safety metrics and have done significant work on this topic as well. 
And in this panel, we will discuss, uh, we will start with a brief presentation from each of the panelists fo followed by discussions. If the audience have questions, please put them in the chat box, uh, all in the Q&A, and we will get there, get those questions from there. So I will briefly introduce each panelist before their presentation, and we're gonna start with um, Dr. Um, David, David LaBlanc. Dr. LaBlanc is associate research scientist, as well as the head of engineering systems group at University of Michigan's Transportation Research Institute. His research focuses on autom automatic and human control of motor vehicles, particularly requirement and assessment of ADAS and connected, uh, and connected automated driving systems. Um, Dave has led many projects for government and industry sponsors, and uh, his research group include uh, Armtree's instrumentation and naturalistic uh, database teams. He holds a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Michigan, and prior to Armtree, um, he worked in automotive and aerospace industry. Dave? Hi, thanks, Henry. And uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to um, be joining this panel. There's uh, a lot of uh, interesting ideas I, th I think are going to come out here and a lot of experience that, you know, I'm pretty familiar with uh, publications from each of the folks here. Um, what I'd like to do in, you know, in just four or five minutes is kind of um, maybe help folks in the audience, some of them get kind of acclimated, you know, when uh, you first uh, bring up the question of safety metrics in automated vehicles, it's, you know, I think it's everyone's kind of instinct to think, well, there's going to be one or two or three magic, you know, uh, measures, time to collision in this form or something like that. But actually, the, uh, the applications of the metrics are uh, pretty broad and pretty wide. And so uh, a few of these slides are just going to try to set a little bit of context. Um, safety metrics, uh, at least in my thinking, are sort of um, uh, algorithmic formulas or maybe just uh, measures um, that help to quantify the safety behavior of a vehicle as it's running down the road, you know, staying in its lane, making maneuvers, dealing with other traffic, pedestrians, traffic lights, things like that. So how do you take that behavior and quantify it in a way that will support kind of higher level questions of safety. Some of the uses uh, for metrics would include uh, development of an automated driving system, uh, corporate testing, verification and validation. You know, is our system working the way we want it to in a safe way? Or it could be done as the vehicles are beginning to be put out in, in pilot uh, deployments, like in Phoenix and San Francisco, as, as we all know from the press. Um, and what happens as more and more vehicles get out there? What happens as uh, others, not just the ADS developer, but perhaps regulators or companies that want to lease a thousand of these vehicles, how do they know that they're safe? So there's a lot of uses, a lot of users, a lot of situations. This little diagram here sort of uh, shows one version of going from you know, designing an ADS on the far left, you know, what are the requirements that we want to have in our vehicle? Um, and as folks kind of create algorithms and they find out you know, capabilities and challenges, how does that happen? Um, then the pilot testing, as I mentioned, you know, in cities where there are um, you know, still engineers driving around, um, that can be tens of thousands of hours that are accumulated. And then early deployment, uh, such as, for example, you know, Waymo in Phoenix, um, there's limited uh, ride sharing actual, with actual citizens uh, from the public. And then kind of in the long future, kind of a mass deployment, you know, thousands of vehicles, everyday sort of thing. Um, and so as these stages go along, um, kind of confidence in the design changes, uh, the amount of data that you have to apply your met metrics changes quite a bit. And so that's where, as Henry mentioned, you get this idea of leading metrics, which are sort of predictive, and then kind of lagging metrics, which are really kind of like 
the facts, how many crashes, how many crashes per mile, et cetera. Um, so some of the leading metrics, which is the stage that we're all in right now, um, there's not tens of thousands of vehicles out there. Um, we don't know what the baselines are. And so um, we're in this game of sort of trying to predict, uh, measure limited amount of experience and try to kind of project it into the future to some degree to say, is this design safer than that design? Things like that. So some of the dimensions of safe driving, and, and you may see a couple of versions of this today, defensive driving, you know, positioning your vehicle so that you're ready for trouble, um, crash imminent response, what happens when trouble comes, um, complying with traffic rules, um, and responsible driving habits. And so a couple types of metrics are shown here. Kinematic metrics are things like having to do with distance, speeds, accelerations, uh, things like time to collision. Um, you know, how many seconds, if nothing changes, how many seconds would it be until I hit that vehicle? Also a different type of metric is this traffic rule compliances. You know, it could be the number of inappropriate lane uses per thousand miles or, or something like that. So these are sort of, as you can see, the metrics are sort of in between kind of relatively low, lay, uh, low level, but able to be aggregated into meaningful findings. Now, one thing that you can notice pretty quickly is that the metrics may, design, may depend on the data and on the user. We've already talked about scale of driving exposure. If you have lots and lots and lots of miles as we do today with conventional vehicles, the metrics there are you know, injury crashes, crashes divided by you know hundreds of millions of miles, billions of miles. So, um, but that's not where we are. So there's these kind of leading metrics, surrogate type metrics. Also, if uh, depending on the user of the metric, you may know a lot about the vehicle, you may have designed the vehicle, so that as you get your experience in a limited way, you can take kind of sketchy situations and then throw it into your simulation and see what might have played out. So in some ways you take these little seeds of events and, and kind of look at the, the safety capacity of your vehicle. If you're a third party though, and you don't know anything about the vehicle, you know you want to lease a thousand of these things for your new taxi service. Um, you, have, you don't have uh, all this information and knowledge of these models of how the vehicle's going to behave, for example. So, in addition to that, I mean, there are just kind of ongoing uh, challenges of some of these metrics. So I'll throw out four of them here in the next couple of slides. One is, you know, with this kind of leading metric, um, can you catch the true risk factors? The little figure on the right here is supposed to show um, as you are approaching a crash along this uh, axis here, um, and you're observing the vehicle, you expect some braking decision perhaps to happen and the probability might look as I've shown here. Um, and so, um, but also what might happen is if your vehicle has perception problems, maybe it's raining like crazy, uh, the sun is just at the wrong angle, glinting off of windows, um, there might be another mode of failure here, which is just perception. So um, you want the metric to be looking somewhere Kind of in this zone where all the discretionary decisions of design have kind of played out and now you're kind of getting to the point where you can get an idea about the true failure mechanisms. Um, also as we do these metrics we're very concerned um, about whether a third-party metric such as you know this leasing company is applying a metric that's going to disadvantage one design over the other um, sort of unknowingly. Um, other challenges are you want a metric that kind of is monotonic with risk. I think you'll hear this phrase a few times. It basically means as the risk of a crash grows, you want the metric to go in one direction. And ideally, you would like the metric to sort of measure the same amount of risk in one situation as in another situation, so that when you aggregate these metrics over time, you kind of get Kind of a holistic safety situation. Um, and also another challenge is if there's lots, if you're in a city and there's lots of activity in the traffic, um, you know, how 
how do you deal with that risk of kind of multiple threats um, and possibly your evasion? So uh, lots of challenges. I'm kind of interested to see uh, about some of the other ideas and to have the Q&A later. So that's, uh, Henry, that's... Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Thank you, Dave. And we're going to move on to our second panelist, uh, Dr. Jeff uh, uh, Wishart. Um, Jeff is a managing engineer at the testing, uh, at the test and engineering center of Exponent, um, as well as adjunct professor in automotive systems uh, in the School of Engineering at uh, Arizona State University. Um, Dr. Rishard uh, conduct research and development in the area of energy and advanced transportation, including advanced powertrains, connected automated vehicles, electrical vehicle supply equipment, energy storage system, and micro mobility uh, applications. Um, Dr. Wishart is also the chair of the Verification and Validation Task Force under um, the Unroll uh, Automated uh, Driving SAE Committee. And um, um, Dr. Wishart has a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the Institute of uh, Integrated Energy Systems at uh, the University of uh, Victoria um, uh, and uh, MS in Engineering Physics. Uh, and BS in engineering, uh, uh, engineering physics um, from the University of British Columbia. I, I believe uh, Jeff is going to talk about the uh, uh, standard and uh, uh, regulations related uh, with safety metrics. Jeff? Thanks very much, Henry. Can you hear me all right? Yep. And you can see uh, my screen, hopefully. Sure. So I, I'm very proud to be part of this esteemed panel, and I really think that David set the, the table quite well. What I'm going to talk about here are, are some of the regulation standards and best practices that are out there, uh, mostly with a US focus, but uh, on the regulation side, some, something from the UNECE. Um, just basically, how do we get to a, a point where we're all agreeing on what metrics uh, should be uh, used and, and how, how we might get there? So I think that uh, everyone agrees that there's a need for what we're calling, what I call with the, the operational safety assessment or OSA metrics to safely deploy automated vehicles on public roads and understand the impacts. We don't quite yet have consensus yet on what OSA metrics should be used. And there are lots of factors to consider and David uh, laid out a few of them. From my perspective, uh, there, are, there are some things like data access. Uh, where are you going to be, are you looking at data coming from the ADS, the automated driving system itself, or can you get things from outside of it, including off-board sources? Um, are you covering everything in your ODD, your operational design domain? Are there going to be situations where the metrics aren't applicable? You want to make sure that they're, co they're comprehensive. Uh, David talked about some of this uh, where it comes to subjectivity, the, the, the parameters and thresholds, they might be different for different areas, different locations. Uh, so you have to carefully consider uh, any subjectivity in your metric. The kinematic components of the DDT, your, your dynamic driving task, uh, you want to make sure that you're covering as many as possible. Some, some metrics, uh, maybe pick on the TTC for a moment, don't consider things like acceleration. So it makes it less uh, comprehensive in that way. You also want to minimize false negatives when you uh, are actually in an unsafe situation, but the metric is not telling you, or and uh, minimizing false positives when you're in a safe, when you're actually in a uh, safe position, but the metric is telling you you aren't. So um, that, that's, you want to minimize both of those. And then you want to do some validation, uh, including real world data. How do you know that your metrics are, uh, are, are actually providing the, the outcomes that you want? And David talked about this as well, uh, the comfort metrics, the later but, but harder breaking, for example, uh, do you want to include those or we want to focus mostly or maybe exclusively only on safety metrics? There currently are no US federal regulations of metrics, although they were mentioned as a need uh, in the recent advance notice of proposed rulemaking by NHTSA. Um, several states have implemented various OSA metrics. Uh, California, for example, ha has their disengagement metric, which is seen by some as um, not ideal, especially on its own. Uh, if you are driving in a not very challenging set of scenarios, uh, you can, and, and so you get fewer disengagements, 
you might look better than a, an ADS developer that's driving in complex scenarios and getting a lot of disengagements, but you, you know, I don't think that's really indicative of the progress that you're making. So uh, it's, it's important to you don't use misleading metrics. So I, I said I talked about the UNECE uh, in April 2020. Uh, the UNECE released their their document uniform provisions concerning the approval of vehicles with regard to automated lane keeping systems. Bit of a mouthful there. It's the world's first regulation of a driving automation feature, so quite notable in that respect. 67 con countries adopt UNECE regulations. Uh, I'm not sure if they all will adopt this, but at least 67 countries do. Um, you know, subscribe to, to this to these regulations. So it has uh, operational safety requirements for simple scenarios, a car following scenario, a cut in, as Henry discussed, a cut out when the vehicle in front of you uh, cuts out from in front of you and that reveals a stationary object. And then if in the far car following situation, if you have uh, a lead vehicle decelerating. Now the regulation limits the speed of the feature to 60 kilometers an hour. And it requires uh, an operational data storage. So it had to keep track of, of things and events that are occurring. In the car following scenario, the following distance regulation is analogous to time headway. Uh, so you can see the equation on the right. It has a, a minimum distance, minimum following distance, has the present speed of the vehicle and the, the time gap uh, that you, you must leave. And as you can see in this table, based on uh, your given speed, you have, a minimum, you have a minimum time gap and a following distance. And it's using an acceleration of five meters per second squared. Accelerations exceeding these are considered to be emergency maneuvers. So like I picked on the TTC, I'll pick on the time headway a little bit as well. Uh, it does not consider the reaction time of, your, of the subject vehicle. It does not consider the velocity of the adversarial vehicle does not consider the acceleration or, or acceleration de deceleration capability of either vehicle. And it's really only applicable in longitudinal based scenarios in this basic formulation. Like obviously things can be modified to uh, account for other types of situations. So I'd say this is a positive first step in regulation, uh, including specifying some OSA metrics, but it's not comprehensive and it can lead to false negatives in, in certain scenarios. So that's on the regulation side, uh, not much happening at the moment, although I, I think it, it is coming. Um, so what are we doing on the best practice and standard side of things? Uh, the IAM, the Institute of Automated Mobility, of which I'm a part, uh, we initiated an OSA metrics project way back in September 2019 in another, <laughs> another world, it sounds, it seems like. Uh, and we released our, our foundational paper at the 2020 SEWCX event. We did a really comprehensive literature review. Some 60 papers were, were reviewed. We included historical traffic safety metrics, the time to collision, modified time to collision, post encroachment time and time headway, uh, in part because we think that there's a lot of data, a lot of work is done been done to validate these in different situations for uh, human driven vehicles. So we thought it made, made sense to uh, keep them at least for now while we, uh, before we whittled down to, I guess, a comprehensive and finalized set we also incorporated the Intel Mobileye Responsibility Sensitive Safety RSS framework into several, several of our metrics. So we created what we hope to, be, hope to be a comprehensive set that require little to no ADS data access. And I'll talk about those in a sec um, later on. So we, we have safety envelope, behavioral perception planning and control metrics. Uh, and we'll talk about those shortly. Uh, more recently, the Automated Vehicle Safety Consortium released their method, metrics and methods best practice just last month. Uh, their focus is on ADS developers and manufacturers. So they have two categories of metrics types, and, and David talked about these. They have safety outcomes or lagging metrics and predictive, sometimes called leading metrics. Uh, we were, uh, from, uh, from the IBM perspective, we were pleased to see that the, the philosophy seems to be the same uh, in what they were putting out as a, as a best practice in terms of a metric set to what we were putting out as well. Um, and they also included methods for implementation of recommended metrics. And you can see the, the list of, of companies um, pretty prominent in the, in the uh, automotive world. So from a uh, standards perspective um, in the US, there's, there are others, but uh, most notable probably is the SAE On-Road Automated Driving Committee, ORAD, uh, was created to address some of the challenges with ADS development. So it was responsible for SAE J3016. Uh, you may 
is basically the, the, the go-to taxonomy for driving automation levels used throughout the world. Uh, underneath that is the VNV Task Force under ORAD is developing a, 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 a NSA document J3237 on OSA metrics. Uh, and I chaired that along with Jack Wiest of Intel Mobileye. So uh, this is my, I think, last slide. I just want to talk briefly about the, uh, the taxonomy that we're using, at least for now, uh, still early days in this document development. Uh, but the data source level, black box, gray box, and white box, which is really where the data are coming from in terms of when you're measuring. Um, for black box, you don't need any data from the ADS itself, although you could get some and you, it, would, it might pro provide a lower measurement uncertainty. Um, gray box metric requires some access to the, the ADS, but not extensive. And then a white box metric being uh, a metric that you would need significant uh, ADS data. So that's kind of, we, the, the IM perspective was to try and shade to the left, the black box, and, and with a few gray box metrics to try and keep away from the proprietary ADS data. And then underneath that, you have the classification levels. You can see that safety envelope, behavioral component, sensing, perception, planning, and control. So uh, there will be metrics underneath all of these um, in this document. And we'll hope to uh, complete this document and have it out later this year for the community to, I guess, um, you know, take under consideration. I just want to mention my collaborators at IEM. Um, but other than that, Henry, thank you very much. And, and I look forward to uh, questions. Thank you, Jeff. We're going to move on to our third uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Bowen Wong. Um, Bowen is a research engineer at the Transportation uh, Research Center under the assignment to um, um, under assignment to uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NISA. His recent work make, mainly focused on the develop, development of analytical uh, metrics and engineering capability for the safety evaluation of automated driving system. Um, Dr. Wang is uh, one of the main developer uh, for model predictive instantaneous safety metric developed at, uh, at NISA, and I believe he's going to talk about that. Dr. Wang? Thanks, Professor Liu. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Wang. I'm very happy to share with you um, um, some of the research related to operational vehicle safety metric from the model perspective um, that happens recently at Vehicle Test and Research Center. I'd like to start with a very brief discussion about what a metric is, which has been partially covered by a lot of previous uh, speakers, I believe. Um, in general, I'd like, to, I'd like to start from a more of a formal interpretation. Essentially, we consider metric as a mapping or function uh, on the input side, you would be facing the uh, what we call as a snapshot, which is the uh, state space of all the um, possible uh, traffic configurations, position of vehicles, velocity, uh, even weather conditions. You have to specify a particular vehicle, with, which is referred to as a subject vehicle in this case, as your test subject that is denoted by the index. That's why we have the uh, integer, uh, integer space. Um, on the output side, it's typically a real line or a subset of the real line. Um, moreover, uh, such a subset often comes with a certain physical interpretation. For example, time to collision maps everything to time. Um, RSS, the responsibility sensitive safety metric, uh, maps things to maps the snapshots to distance. Um, of course, if you supply it with a distance threshold, uh, you could also consider it as, it is a mapping to a yes or no question or safe or no safe. Um, also, the criticality metric from the Paxas project takes a um, particular range referred to as the criticality um, as the mapping target. Moreover, from a not so formal uh, perspective, more of a con conceptual interpretation, um, we'd like to consider matrix as a way, a special way of generalization. Um, as have um, pointed out by the previous speakers, um, we have a huge, when it comes to ADS safety evaluation, we typically have a huge scenario state space. It is almost impossible to uh, ensure sufficient coverage of all the states. So when the um, matrix comes into the play, it essentially picks on those observed sample states and somehow try to generalize the safety assessment uh, to those unobserved, unsampled states um, by applying uh, some assumptions. And in this case, what, at, at least one of the ways to assert assumptions is to assert some modeled assumptions to the close neighborhood near those uh, observed snapshot. 
Um, I have a very basic example on the right. Um, if you consider a, a very typical standard in NCAP AEB um, car to car system test, which is essentially the vehicle brake, uh, the test can be the trajectory that you collected from performing one of those tests uh, is denoted by the uh, dark solid line. Um, basically, on, over the three dimensional Euclidean domain, you have the subject vehicle velocity, you have the lead vehicle's velocity, and you have the relative uh, distance. When we have a matrix, let's say time to collision, that matrix essentially picks a, a snapshot along those observed states from the collected trajectory. In this case, we have one point highlighted. Starting from that point, the time to collision matrix creates a predictive trajectory, or you can call it an imaginary trajectory, by asserting two important assumptions. The first one is steady state assumption, basically heading and the velocity remain unchanged. And second is a linear double integrated dynamics, which is a point mass model, essentially. Based on those asserted models, you can create this predictive trajectory and somehow generalize your safety assessment outcome from one observed point to some of the unobserved, uh, some of the points that are not necessarily observed or sampled from the collected data. With this perspective, it is, it is kind of a natural follow-up question to ask what are the models and assumptions one can assert to achieve safety assessment and generalization. Of course, uh, those are certain models and assumptions are not necessarily unique. Um, in particular, we'd like to talk about uh, this model predictive instantaneous safety matrix that we recently um, presented at IV 2020. The particular assumption that we choose to assert to the close neighborhood near those observed points is what we call a, a min max optimization problem or worst case optimization. Uh, essentially, uh, the matrix seeks to create a scenario uh, that is the worst outcome for the subject vehicle, identifying whether the subject vehicle would have the capability to maintain the safety status uh, up to the given time horizon. Um, this, uh, this essentially forms a mean maximum optimization problem as highlighted by the line six of the algorithm. Um, that optimization tar um, problem typically uh, essentially gives you a, a predictive distance. If that distance is smaller or equal to a, um, a constant C, then it, it is considered as unsafe or higher risk. Um, if somehow the subject vehicle um, remains safe for continuously n steps or up to a certain predictive time horizon, then the vehicle is considered safe. With this in mind, um, we, can, we can consider a very simple example. We call it a highway exit scenario. Uh, basically, the subject vehicle is operating at the leftmost lane. Uh, there is the uh, exit on, on the right, and um, um, there are also two vehicles in the middle lane. Uh, typically, there are three possible maneuvers you would expect from the subject vehicle, which is a dual lane change uh, in the rail, through the middle, or in the front of the two vehicles. Um, technically, you can certainly create behaviors, I mean, all of those three behaviors, uh, with fairly good utility score, meaning that they can finish the task, they can reach the exit on time, and they won't have any collisions against um, any of the vehicles. However, it is it, it is fairly obvious that the, the, the three maneuvers should not share the same safety performance score. In this particular case, Amprism is able to capture those kind of subtle difference among the three behaviors. Um, if you look at the first the subplot, uh, the door lane change through the rail is not illustrated. It essentially means that uh, none of the snapshots collected from the door lane changing the rail maneuver uh, satisfy the predictive collision condition um, defined by Amprism uh, for the given um, predicted time horizon up to one second. In the meanwhile, the, um, it, is also, it also aligns with intuition that the door lane change through the middle is typically the more dangerous uh, or higher risk uh, maneuver, which is also highlighted by the uh, lower uh, Ampere TTC value. Uh, the last thing I like to briefly cover is um, uh, we have a lot of metric assumptions, as I have just mentioned. Um, it is kind of um, important to understand whether we can, um, how can we evaluate those metrics and what kind of comparisons can we uh, perform among those metrics. Analytics speaking, the model the perspective that, that I just presented is kind of a way to, to understand the, the uh, correlation and the difference among many of those metrics. As a matter of fact, we can easily take the model predictive take, um, optimization perspective to formulate many existing metrics, including time to collision, RSS, or criticality metric, 
or SS, SFF from the video. Um, however, it is also important, as the previous speakers have uh, mentioned, that more considerations should be established uh, to understand what are the main for publicly acceptable uh, constraints, assumptions, and simplifications one could consider uh, to build a, a metric. Moreover, um, maybe by, by the end of the day, we're not looking at a particular matrix. It could be a combination of many metrics and each metric will have a, um, its own um, perspective um, or specialty on a particular dom subdomain of safety evaluation. That's for the analytical side. From the empirical side, we believe it is important to um, at least have the comparison against the same set of examples. Uh, you can imagine it as a benchmark a performance uh, database. Um, everyone can bring the matrix um, use and use the matrix to analyze the same uh, snapshots, the same case. Um, ex currently, there are not that good database out there. Most of the self-driving database focus on, traditionally focus on traffic microscopic traffic study, such as NGSIM or um, Heidi. Um, there are there some other self-driving database um, primarily focus on um, perception targets. Uh, so both of those uh, uh, database lack tr um, traffic trajectory accuracy and there are also lack of uh, safety critical interactions. Some of the undergoing VRTC efforts are seeking to uh, remedy this gap and provide a uh, uh, database from our real life uh, testing data to help analyze or compare uh, the safety performance of different metrics and um, empirically. That's all I have to say, thank you very much. Thank you, Bowman. Um, I'd like to move to our fourth panelist, um, Dr. Arno Ichberg. Um, Dr. Ichberg is an associate professor uh, in, automotive, in automotive engineering in Graz University of Technology, TU Graz in Australia. Uh, Austria. Um, he, he received uh, his uh, doctor degree in technical science in 1998 uh, with, with distinctions from the same university. From 1998 to 2007, um, Dr. Ichberg was uh, working at uh, Magna and deals with different aspects of active and passive safety. Um, since 2007, he has been uh, with uh, Institute of Automotive Engineering at TU Graz as the West Director of the Institute and Head of the Research Area on Vehicle Dynamics. And his research interests include development and testing of automotive driving, human-machine interaction, vehicle dynamics control and suspension um, um, development. And uh, um, I believe he's going to talk about uh, um, uh, the European activities related with safety metrics. Um, uh, Arno? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And also see my screen. Um, your screen right now, I think it's Jeff's screen. Uh, it's it's um, you probably opened the. Uh... Yep, okay. I can see you. I can see your screen. That's good. Okay. Good. Uh, as I said, thank you uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, I won't talk too, uh, too much in detail because um, my, the other speakers have done a pretty good job uh, to define all the problems and challenges. I would like to draw a bit the uh, focus on what is going on in, in, in Europe. And I'm thanking here to my colleagues, Mr. Nalec and Mr. Michael, who helped me to prepare this presentation. So uh, it was already uh, said um, what kind of metrics uh, matrices are available. I would say I would um, distribute it, it or uh, distinguish it in a more traditional approach. So derived from analysis of criticality of pressures and conflicts, you get this uh, classically safety metrics uh, that you find in the literature. There are many literature reviews uh, around. We already had an example today. Uh, one I picked out, uh, they distinguished between temporal distance based, deceleration based, and other uh, safety metrics. For example, we talked already about uh, TTC. Uh, some uh, metrics like the SSAM uh, prepared by Gettman for Federal Highway. Um, administration 
uh, try to combine this, for example, the severity of conflict, uh, taking into account TTC, post encroachment time and disallergement, and combined it also with the collision severity, uh, for example, using the maximum speed or the speed differential. So this is nothing new, something we heard already. Uh, but what is going uh, to be used uh, uh, with this in Europe? At the moment, uh, we see one uh, if, um, um, large uh, project, or, or, or um, it's called the Pierce Consortium, which means prospective effectiveness assessment in road safety. And this targets uh, against the harmonization of methods and approaches. So it's not a principal target to the, um, define new safety metrics here. The, final, uh, the primary target is to assess the safety benefit of different systems and different uh, safe, um, uh, system um, parameters. In this consortium, OEMs, suppliers, research organizations, and university are included. And as we heard to, uh, already today, uh, the basis always is crash data, is natural driving studies, it's field operational uh, uh, trials and others. And what is going to um, uh, produce, it's a sort of establishment of a baseline. So there is a baseline which describes what has, been, what has happened at a certain uh, period. And this baseline is uh, calculated with virtual simulation with, so the baseline and without a specific safety technology, maybe a emergency brake assist or something else. And using metrics, um, this uh, consortium is aiming to estimate the effectiveness, but especially to harmonize uh, a variety of methods and approaches used by the different participants. And here they use leading and lagging metrics, like we already heard today. But the lagging metrics, especially with the number of crashes in the baseline and the avoided crashes, crash severity, or the reduction of injury by using injury risk functions. I put you also the source here if you have more interest in for the peers. So this uh, approach more or less. Uh, requires that the trajectory are recorded or measured or simulated, so they are known and we can apply these more or less kinematic approaches uh, and analyze the data. Another approach with, which uses similar metrics, um, you can uh, see from Hillenbrand, uh, from Daimler, and this is more used for analysis of crit criticality for decision making. Of automated, of automated driving. So you don't know the trajectories in advance, you need to predict the states. And this is done in the workflow as we see here in this, in this picture. You start with the current states of the, the subject vehicle and the uh, other vehicles, and you predict the future trajectories with different methods. And with this, you calculate safety metrics as we already discussed uh, today. And these are finally resulting in metrics with address uh, collision avoidance. So they are addressing longitudinal, time to break, and time to kick down to avoid the collision, or lateral collision avoidance with the time to steer. And those are summarized in a so-called so time to, uh, to react value, TTR, which is the minimum of, of all the others. And in principle, we can consider those um, values similar to TTC, but they're considering the last point to take in reactive vehicle control to avoid the accident. This uh, uh, work, well, it's 10 years uh, ago, it was used in the uh, German Pegasus project. So we were not part of this project since my university is coming from Austria, but um, we have good. Um, connections uh, to the people. And there, uh, the criticality assessment was done with a kind of top-down approach. So uh, trajectories for collision avoidance were calculated similar to the work of Bilmbaum. Uh, the criticality of these calculated trajectories were evaluated. And finally, 
using a combined scale, these events were um, de um, declared as not critical, eventual critical, or critical. And the criticality is now uh, a summary of, of, of different states uh, comprised of reserve. So we have the reaction time, the time to react here that we already spoke, but also the reserve that the vehicle provides you. Example, the sensor systems, the field of view, and the tire to road grip, which uh, um, is a part of the uh, possible dynamics to avoid an accident. But it also includes something as uh, some sort of a correction, uh, because uh, as you don't know the future trajectories, you may, you may have to do estimations about the driver behavior um, and the, um, the surroundings of the um, dynamic objects. And here the researchers um, used probability distribution from field tests um, to calculate the most probable trajectory and apply the metrics. And you can read more in this um, uh, research here, uh, the work of units. So this is already what I would like to, what I'd like to tell you at this um, uh, time. And I'm happy to answer questions in the follow-up panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Eichberg. Um... So now we, we have all uh, panelists present their, uh, um, um, their views on safety metrics. I'd like to uh, just start the discussion by asking some of the questions I have in my mind. Um, I'd like to start with uh, follow up with uh, Dr. LaPlanck's comments on uh, monotonicity uh, um, with uh, crash risk. Um, do you think, um, I, we can start with you, but I'm asking the whole panel, do you think, uh, uh, what are the criteria for a good uh, uh, safety metric? Um, um, uh, should uh, a, a good uh, safety metric uh, monotonically uh, be increased with safe crash risk? Um, do we have a um, you know benchmark uh, or something to compare different safety metrics in terms of uh, um, their uh, effectiveness? <laughs> uh, a good question and a hard one, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, we the idea that you know a metric would provide an actual measure of the probability. Uh, that you might get into a crash or, or, or the risk level. Uh, I think that's, you know, what we'd all love to have. The, the uh, trouble, of course, is that we're, I think, you know, we're often thinking of multiple systems that are designed rather differently at some times. And, you know, by basically, um, you know, it's like riding in a New York City taxi cab. You're trying to figure out at what point do you yell at the driver that they're going to get in, into trouble, and, and the experienced ones can really go uh, to the edge. So um, it, it's a hard thing, I think, to come up with a truly monotonic uh, measure that will work across scenarios, especially. Um, other thoughts? Yeah, maybe I'll just follow up. I think the issue right now and it's, it, is that we don't have much data uh, for automated vehicles. And so that's why the IEM kept some of those historical traffic safety metrics because there, we do have data. Of course, those are for human driven vehicles. And so it's it's a question of kind of chicken and egg. We, we need to set a metric, but we don't have the data to say whether it provides, uh, if you set the threshold, for example, on, on a time to collision or time headway um, of two or three seconds, you don't know if that's safe for an automated vehicle. You know, you can kind of say how safe it is for a human driven vehicle. So we need a lot of data, but on the other hand, like I said, we do need to have metrics set so that we can, so we can gather those data. So it's, it's a it's chicken and egg problem, but uh, and I think we're all uh, in the same boat trying to figure out, out of that, a way out of that. Owen, do you have any comments on that? Uh, yes, um, I think the crash risk can more, other than the problem that I just mentioned, I think one of the challenges for the crash risk analysis is that uh, the current crash risk is largely built upon the uh, assumption that we're dealing with human drivers. The driver mm -hmm. behavior distribution is kind of stable. Uh, you should not expect too much surprise when you look at those behaviors statistically. However, I think it is unclear at this moment how significant 
this driver behavioral distribution would shift when you have uh, the auto automated vehicle dominating the the uh, vehicle world. Uh, when you it, when you currently only have a hundred, a thousand of them, it, it doesn't does not matter. In most of the cases, you are still having a machine dealing with a human, a, a group of human driven vehicles. But what if it's a, a machine dealing with a group of machine driven vehicles, AI driven, you may have software updates occasionally. It is possible that those um, frequent software updates will not affect the behavior distribution fundamentally or significantly, but no one knows, at least at this moment. Um, I guess as for the metric design, it comes to another point that maybe we also need a a, a framework that can adapt to possible changes as the behavioral distrib distribution shifts. Um, yeah, that's that's why I want to add up. Okay, Yitzbrook, do you have anything to add on that? Um, what comes to me when I think of, uh, of criteria for, for uh, metrics is if you think of uh, dr dr drowsy drivers uh, and uh, developing algorithms to uh, assess the, the level of drowsiness, you always have the problem, what is the ground truth? And I think this is something similar uh, in, in, in safety. So what is the ground truth? What is the real, um, um, the, the real uh, risk? The metrics that can give you an assessment, a more or less um, uh, assessment of, of the criticality, but you still don't know what is the ground truth. So maybe if you focus on a formal way to define criteria, you could say, we need accurate metrics. Mm -hmm. We need metrics that are robust, so they don't uh, oscillate in a, certain, uh, in a certain scenario, and jumping from not critical, critical um, um, in a moment of time. We have the criteria of the calculation time, so are you offline or online? Do you need it to predict or do you need, uh, want to assess um, the, the, the risk? And finally, should also be sensitive to certain parameters, to certain scenarios, to certain uh, situations. And also they should be easily interpretable. So if the, the definition of a safety a matrix is so complicated and you cannot understand anymore, it's sometimes hard to interpret all the things. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's an excellent point, and uh, I totally agree with you. Um, that's why I think uh, what Bowen motion, uh, mentioned, the benchmark data set, it's very, very important so that we have something we can compare against with. But uh, uh, I think I want to go a little bit further on the benchmark uh, data sets. Even you have a benchmark. Let's say you, I mean, you have collected the uh, large amount of data. You have the data sets available in terms of, you know, the driving situations. You got all the um, um, uh, surrounding vehicle position, speed, whatever these information you will need. But um, in terms of the safety metric, we don't still we still don't know what what exactly is the you know uh, how risky it is. There's no uh, the benchmark versus the ground truth. There's no also no ground truth on to compare with that. Um, uh, uh, also, so I, I think that's uh, uh, another um, uh, important uh, area um, the community has to uh, work on, so that uh, we know um, we have a you know a benchmark, and we know that uh, uh, what is what is a good criteria for uh, for a safety metric. Yeah, I, I'd, say, I'd say that if we had a bunch, a large data set, but we didn't have any actual collisions, you know, that makes it difficult. We can have lots of what we think might be risky situations but without a collision. Not that I'm hoping for collisions, of exactly. course, but it's hard to know what that, how much risk those situations pose without the collisions. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not a simple, uh, simple thing. Exactly, exactly. But, but uh, I, I think one, one thing we can do on that is that uh, we can synthesize the database with uh, the, 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 real, the data from the real world as well as some of the data from simulation and others so that we do have these crushes, um, you know, a sizable uh, amount of uh, crushes so that we can, we can play with. But uh, I, I think that that's an error. Uh, I think I, I uh, uh, very much uh, deserve some of the research. 
And um, I, you know, I love, I'd like to move on to other questions and I see questions from the audience as well. And, and I want to remind the audience that if you have questions, you can put into uh, uh, the Q and A's uh, chat box. We don't have a lot of time, but I want to uh, get to one of these questions. Um, and this is a, a question coming from the audience. Um, how the safety surrogate measures can be effectively, effectively used for automated vehicles uh, mixed with human driven vehicles on roads at uh, a mixed traffic scenario. And also which one can be the best measures um, besides the threshold selections in mixed traffic for safety surrogate measure is also a critical uh, factor. So, so that's a question I have as well. I mean, that we can, uh, Jeff, you, 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 your paper lists so many of these, uh, um, you know, uh, these performance measures that has been, uh, has been uh, uh, developed over the years. Um, and, and is there, is, is, pos is possible for us to identify the best measure or um, all these are, you know, different measures for different use and it just depends upon your purpose? Yeah, I mean, I think it was David said that no single metric is gonna get you there. So I, I don't know if we'll ever say that this metric is the best metric because uh, you know, the philosophy of the IAM is that we'll have a set of metrics, each kind of with its own purpose, all contributing towards a comprehensively, uh, being able to comprehensively assess a given vehicle as it navigates any number of scenarios with, within the ODD. Uh, but what to answer the question, the first part of that question, uh, how do we do automated vehicles mixed with human driven vehicles? From the IAM perspective, we, as, we, as I mentioned, uh, focused on um, black box metrics so that we uh, don't need access to the ADS, whether there's an ADS or not. These metrics will apply to both human driven vehicles and automated vehicles. And then we get into some of the gray box metrics so that if you, one of them is, is the ADS uh, completing the, the dynamic driving task, the DDT? And if so, if you know that that's the case, you know it's an automated vehicle. So then you can, you, you can use the black box metrics for both the gray box metrics for automated vehicles, and then you, get a, you can look at a mixed uh, set of traffic. Mm -hmm. just, just to follow up on that particular question, I think I will ask this on, on Bowen and uh, Dr. Eichberg, is that um, but when you, you develop that uh, man prism, which is you know, really the worst case scenario, um, it's, uh, and then if you compare that with PCM, which is the Pegasus criticality, is basically the steady state scenario. The, if everybody contain their current state, what's going to happen? And then with uh, uh, certain assumptions with, uh, with, the object, uh, with the automated vehicle. So um, when you compare these two, what are the use cases you, 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 you think these will be utilized? In what situations these two type of you know, performance um, safety metrics will be used? Thanks for the question. I guess this also answers the first question that the audience raises. So there are things that a driver just cannot do, regardless of who drives the car. It could be a machine, it could be a, a, a human. There are things that you just cannot do. Uh, to a certain extent, the MIMAX optimization problem seeks to find that threshold. You know, that's where that minimum kind of red tape kind of threshold that, that you just cannot do. It may not be the single metric that for, serves for the final safety assessment purpose. Uh, that's why I also mentioned those um, uh, multi-dimensional thing. Um, like not just five star, you have one star for rollover, another star for dynamic uh, stability or some other crash impact. You could have a star for safety in the min-max sense. You could have another star for the safety in the steady state coupled with uh, minimization sense. You could, could have another star for confidence, you know, Whenever you perform a hard break, I just don't like it. Uh, you could have another sort of utility. Well, you may have a very good safety score, but you may be very conservative, such that you can the, the time it takes for you to reach from A point A to B is significantly long. Um, so yeah. There, there's just so much to talk about on safety metric. There's so much work need to be done on this area as well. And uh, we just don't have that much of time. I was remind that uh, with the time for this panel discussion is up. And I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists. Uh, thank you very much for your enlightening talks and then uh, the follow up uh, quest uh, discussions on the safety metric, which is really, really important issue for the automated vehicle development. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.